the, the next one, you know, is, is quite a twist on the work that we do. And I think, you know, um, cybersecurity would not be effective if we didn't know what we, why we are doing this. And that's why we have always been in this community and our extended partners communities, been very focused on the purpose and the values that drive those purpose. So very recently, and thanks to my good friend here, Guri, um, I got to know someone, I'll let Mandeep introduce herself, that actually took that whole sense of purpose that we had and kind of gave us the lens of how the world looks at it, right? And we have very, very, you know, really glaring examples of really purpose-led and value-driven leaders in this community. But I, after reading Mandeep's uh, book and talking to her and listening to her speak, I really got moved by the fact that what we do really resonates with the world that is that you know we are trying to protect and defend. So, I'll, Mandeep, please come off stage. Uh, we're going to do a quick talk about the values that drive us as professionals, as human beings. Great to have you here. Uh, hey, how about introductions, and then uh, I, I'll let you talk. I'm not going to take any minute away from your talk. So. This is a fireside chat, so you have to talk. Oh my God! All right, we'll try. We'll try. Okay. We should do. And um, just to say, we're here to serve you, so I'd rather this be interactive. Um, and we can have a roaming mic, since we have th extra mics here. So if anybody has anything to say at any point, there's no Q&A at the end, I'd love you to be involved. Because okay. you know, the more we can be inclusive and collaborative, I think we mentioned on the panel, collaboration. If it's not collaborative, it's not working. So, so Mandeep, a little bit of your, start with your, with your background and the history. Like, I think 115 countries or 150 countries? 180. 180 countries. So I've worked in over 180 countries. So she has worked in 180 countries. She has traveled to each of them and picked up the values that these countries represent. And, you know, uh, definitely go read the book or, or hear in the Audible, The Values Compass. Shameless plug. I will tell you that you'll, you'll, be, you'll be really, you know, moved. Uh, and, and, and if you think about, no, maybe you turn to different, I, I think we have different countries represented here. Go look at your country and, and I'll tell you how she has captured that. All right. So, so a little bit of background and how this relates to how we can, you know, pick this up and actually, you know, address in our life. Yeah. So you're here because you're, I think generally, you're either CISOs or you have an organization that is looking at cyber, right? So you're here to protect. You're here to protect. All right, so the Values Compass takes you to over 101 different countries. And each country has been distilled into a different value. And right now, as you're beginning the year and you're trying to motivate your team and you're trying to kind of align what you're doing in your organization or in your life, then if you have a sense of purpose or mission, align it to your values. So first, this is basically a tool. It helps you figure out what re why you're doing what you're doing, or more importantly, takes you, strips you right back to what motivates you, what makes, what gives you joy. And of all, like when we say values, we might mean empathy, creativity, defense, responsibility, accountability, excellence. I mean, all of these are values. I'm trying to think of what you might be motivated by given the fact that you're here. It could be connection. So whatever, whatever it is, this helps you kind of figure out your top five, but the power is in prioritizing those. So to have a number one, and then a number two, three, four, five. And then the way you make decisions, whether it's you having to report about something within four to six hours, or whether it's you, you know, you're having to make record, you're basically having to make speed, make decisions with speed that's almost subhuman, like, um, you know, not possible. Do you know what I mean? You have to have done the thinking beforehand. That's only possible if you know your core values. Because once you know your values, it's like the modus operandi or the software that's running your brain. That work is already done. Then you can make decisions with the record-breaking speed that you need. So I think that's... So, maybe <laughs> you just it. quickly pick someone and ask about the core yeah. values. As, uh, one value, like you don't have to talk about everything. Okay, so... Um, and I, I know everyone, so I'm not going to... Mandeep, let Mandeep pick. Okay. 
Uh, and we have mics, so we'll take mics around. And um, just to say, why am, I, why am I here talking to you about this? Because, um, so I covered all this, the, the world, because I was a BBC foreign correspondent for the World Service. Um, my background is partly, well, I started off at JP Morgan. I then uh, worked in venture capital. I, we ran the first media venture capital fund in the Middle East, um, as well as the BBC. Basically, there's three arms to my career. But all of the places that I've worked and all of the areas that I've worked in, whether it's been finance, international development, or as a journalist, all of that, I think, I've seen the importance of your work of cybersecurity in all of those domains and seen how one can be undermined if the work that you're doing isn't done. And I can give you some concrete examples of that. But what Val just asked for me to do right now was to say, was you asked, name a, any of you name a country? And we can, yeah, is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so maybe if anyone is from somewhere random or wants to know about somewhere random or if any value is Australia. Okay. Are you from Australia? All right. So I used to study in Australia, right? I'm from the University of Melbourne. And uh, you are too? Yay, alum. Uh, and I worked, for, um, I worked for the government there at the time. Oh my God, it's Isn't WEF all about this? Isn't that exactly why we're at Davos? Because this tiny little you know, mountain has these kind of connections. Right? Yes. Uh, so there's this sense... I don't know if it, I don't think it comes from England because you know how everything seems to come from England when it's in Australia, but this is not the case here. There's this sense of mateship, even the word mate. You're right, mate. Good day, mate. But mateship is something else. It's like they have these sheds in Australia, like men's sheds. He's laughing uh, because men actually. I mean, we're talking about you, know, like this room predominantly is male. This space is male. The CISOs are generally male. But men don't necessarily have that many places to connect and bond and feel safe, secured, encouraged, etc. Whereas in Australia, traditionally, they used to have this sense of, especially during the Second World War and after, places where men would gather, they would be sheds, and they'd either make bikes, cars, whatever, whatever. But really, it was about bonding. And from that came this idea of base, whoever you see, wherever you see them, they're your mate. And it doesn't have to be male to male or male to female or anything. It's just about being there for someone when they need you. And you see this in Australia in a way that if you break down, if your car breaks down, whatever, someone's got your back. And this place that's far flung on the other side of the world, right, huge, if you don't have one another's back, especially given you're outdoors, then you're stuck. So that sense of really looking after one another. And I think, again, just bringing it back to cyber, that's why you're in this space. It's like having, having people's back making sure that whether their money or their resources or their information is secure, making sure that everything that you've worked for your whole life can be destroyed in seconds if you don't have this right. Very true. So I think it's just important. You could be doing the most important work, but if you can't communicate it either to your family, to your team, to the wider world, then it's really hard to have real engagement, right? It's really hard for people to see. I mean, even the term CISO, most people have not heard of that. Most people haven't heard of what you're doing. Or, and you know it takes something. So the more we can break it down to values that are actually connecting each and every one of us, mateship is important for everyone in this room. All right. Connection. Sunil. Sunil. The next one. So I'm curious, in the context of country that was picked, if I had to say, I have to imagine that everyone in the country that was picked is You never take the risk of driving across a river that is on average one foot deep. Because on average, you know, it doesn't tell you what the actual depth might be, right? So how do you, uh, how do you, uh, what I seem to think you're doing is you're averaging our values in a similar way that we average numbers and there's certain risks associated with that. So we've got a good play on words here, right? The word value. So I'm using the word value as in what you, what's most important to you. And this came out of our work we did, extensive work we did at Harvard, where I studied, and MIT. And MIT would use the word value as you're interpreting it. 
a quantity, a value. Now, value versus value. The point is that really the word I think you want to use in this context for your question is stereotype. You're saying, how dare you stereotype a country with one value? We have so many different types of people. We've got you, sir, Sunil, have got all these values in you. There's no way I'm going to say you only stand for empathy. There's no way. You have all of them. So therefore, your country, whether it be America in this instance or wherever, has every single one of these values. I'm not trying to stereotype. There are just many boring books about values that you've never heard about that will never change your life. And all I was trying to do here was create a book or create a movement, indeed. Yes. Well, this is where we're going to go to. We're creating a movement that connects you to your values because it's operating you. And if you're not able to be aware of that, talk about that, connect from that space, you're missing a trick. And so America is known for many, many, many things. But the American dream is something that attracts people from all over the world, really. This level of being entrepreneurial, being able to pivot until you get it right. And you guys are having to pivot all the time. You're having to, you, you make mistakes, right? We all make mistakes and in cyber we make mistakes. And then you pivot and say, well, today we've got a better way of doing it. Or within three hours, we've got a better way of doing it. And the way you're able to spin that in America, it's very different to how you can spin it here in Europe. In Europe, we're a lot slower at being able to pivot. When we make mistakes in corporations or companies, we sink. Even, even, as, a, even as a founder or indeed as a budding entrepreneur, a, an entrepreneur here is not as quick to be able to recover if they've lost money or indeed if their idea has gone bad. They don't get investment as fast. They don't say, oh, every day is a moment of learning and you know, my three different failures just, you know, it's not seen in that way. So the American dream is built on this entrepreneurial spirit in a way that the rest of us could learn from. That's all I'm saying, that, um, that every country has something incredible that it can teach the rest of the world, but each and every one of us does too. I just wanted to give you a way of being, for you, you've all been to places and you can, and you can envision, like, the book is written in two pages, like every country is summarized in the two pages. How can I do that? Well, it's a personal experience. It's thousands of interviews with prime ministers, presidents, shoe cleaners, artists, you name it. Thousands of people have gone into this. But also the aim is simply to say, hey, if you knew about respect in the way that the Japanese take on respect, maybe your business, your day, your life, your legacy would look different. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We've got a question here and yes. then there. So we have two more. Oh, hi. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Guri. I'm from uh, England. Yes. And I'm interested in your view of when the stated values of a country uh, and the reality that people experience is quite different. So how do you kind of deal with that moral injury when people experience the say-do gap? And we have a bit of that going on in England. Yeah, we massively do, yeah. And I've sh actually, that gap is everywhere. The people are people, and there is always a gap between, say, what our politicians are saying, which may be what you're alluding to, or what the psyche of the country is, or what's happening and what you actually feel. So for example, with Brexit, I definitely felt that gap. I remember the day Brexit was voted in, I felt as I literally felt as though I was punched in the stomach. I'm like, wait a minute, I don't know where, where in England are you from? Uh, from London. Where in London are you from? Southwest London. Okay. <laughs> SW3, to be precise. Okay, so I'm NW8. <laughs> this means something, this means we, something. Well, we're just yeah. one side That's of the park from the other. <laughs> No, I expect a knock on the door. Is there a stereotype associated with that question? <laughs> That's true. So the, the reason I ask you is because even in specific parts of London, you have a specific, you have a slightly different sense of community or what people think, right? What people think seems to be in your locality first, the five people you surround yourself with, the ten, et cetera. So in Northwest London versus Southwest London, in Northwest London, I felt as though Brexit was really far away. We are European, we stand for inclusion. I mean, we, so much happens just on my high street because I feel European. And as soon as Brexit happened, restaurants started closing, 
like simple functioning things weren't possible anymore because of what Brexit, because of Brexit. And it wasn't that the country believed Brexit was a good thing. It was simply that stories that were being, messages that were being given at the time had it so that 40, seven point whatever, a percentage of people, you know, it wasn't that everybody voted either. But my point, I think to your point is that, yes, it can be the case that the psyche of the nation, there's a gap between the two. But my aim is not to say, in, in England, I talk about the value of steadfast, like keep calm, carry on, <laughs> right? And we have to, we lost, we changed pres prime ministers three times in like a year, it felt like, we just, kept going, you keep going, you keep going. So it's not to say that everything's going to be cushy and kosher and everything's fine, it's just saying that there's, even in England, there's something that, and I say even in England because I'm born and brought up there, uh, and sometimes it's easier to look in another place in the world and see like, wow, there's something incredible we can learn from there. But when you're in your own country, it's a bit like the frog who's like slowly getting hotter and hotter. You don't, you don't necessarily see what is of value in your own place. And I struggled with England. I was like, hmm, what's so brilliant about here? But anyway, I got there. And the point was that there is, some, there is a psyche even there that we can benefit, or that we do benefit from, but there is always a gap. Even in our own minds, there's a gap between what we think is important and what our behaviors say are important. So like we're lying to ourselves all the time. Wow. And it's just uncovering the truth. Well, I wish we had, we, had, we had much longer time to talk about this and we can go on and on. But I think this was just a teaser for you to really think. Uh, pick up the book if, you, you know, if you've got it just to scan through that. But of course, pick up the book to read it. It's been really um, you know, mind-opening. Thank you. I was just going to say one quick thing. Yeah. Um, one, uh, that although this is a book and a tool, etc., we're thinking of it as a movement. As a, yep. And do you want to say something about that? Yeah, so now I think, you know, we, we are community builders and when Mandeep and I took a 40 minute drive from Guri's house to go meet someone, we said, why don't we really build it as a movement? Because, and there's a, there's a reason we are having this discussion before the AI discussion, because I really wanted to tee off the values bef and, and define the purpose before we go talk about responsible and secure AI for future. So can I just Please. S spin it over to you? Yes. What, are, what is one of the most important values to you that has you be here five years in a row now, like holding this beacon or this flag, gathering all these people together, what is it that you're standing for? This is the tough one she always throws at me and now that, you know. <laughs> Tab turning but, the table. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, um, it's commitment. That's the word I think that it's commitment. But what are you committed to? We are, we are committed to bringing people closer together of different, different backgrounds. Just because, you know, when we started this five or six years back, even when CFF started eight years back, there was not a forum for cyber, you know, cyber security leaders to talk to business or go close to business. And we why were, is cyber security so important to you? Because that's what, you know, today, in today's life, in a digital life that we'll all live in, we cannot, cannot you know, overemphasize the importance of cyber. Defending us in the digital frontiers is what these people do here, right? With the right purpose and with the, you know, centered on the right values. Now I think that's what drives us, you know, that's what drives my personal commitment to this community and why we are here every year. So I'm not a CISO, I'm just a lay person. But even in my life, like my son's school, my children's school, they're like, yeah, someone in our class hacked all our, all our accounts. But mama, he wasn't expelled. So does that mean it's not such a, such a, you know, he hasn't committed anything, nothing bad happened there, or he didn't lie, or it's not bad? It was interesting, the questions it brought yeah. up. Or recently I was cyber attacked during um, a global conflict, which is still continuing, and people were literally har harassing me online. Why haven't you got an opinion? Why haven't you mentioned something about this? What, is, what are you going to say about this? Like... You know, obviously, not obviously, my, my bank accounts, et cetera, have been hacked. I see it all the time. Companies, I was voted um, Business Influencer of the Year 2023. And I, and I found that even people just logging into work, logging in from wherever they are now, like working from home, even that is being manipulated and hacked. And companies can save so much money if they can get this right. So I think your work is fundamental because our lives fortunately or unfortunately are more cyber or online than they are even real, like even 
you know, physical. Very true. That's the future we are going to, you know, live and our, our kids are going to live. So, well done. Thank you, Mandi, for thank all you. the work that you have done. And thank you for coming up here and spending some time with us. Uh, we always talk about cyber security technology, but I think it's, it's important to understand why. Yes. The why. And to communicate right. it well. well. Thank you for awesome. having me. Thank you.